With the new Fire Emblem game comes new intrigue over how the cast is written. Fact of the matter is, unless you're the Lord or Lord adjacent, like royalty, you're only getting some spotlight in your recruitment chapter before you take a backseat to the main character show. But luckily, that's where support conversations come in. Last video I talked about really funny moments in Engage, and I appreciate the reception it got, but there were some folks who were more excited about a video of that nature that focused on Engage's serious moments of characterization. And fortunately, so was I. When the chips are down, can Engage's cast take itself seriously? Before I answer that question though, this video is actually sponsored. Take a look at this. Welcome to Honkai Impact 3rd, a 3D cross-platform anime action game from Hoyoverse, the makers of Genshin Impact and the upcoming Honkai Star Rail. This game has plenty of content to provide players in the form of open-world exploration, immersive stories, real-time action, boss battles, and mini-games both done solo and with your friends. The game is now ready for its next story installment featuring the characters Zila and Susanna a new character for you to play whose music ought to captivate players and crush enemies all at once. Version 6.5 starts off with two new events. The first, the Meow Town Escapade event, has the captains following Susanna to a picturesque town finding kittens. Earn Shiksal emblems and trade them at the event shop for crystals and gear for Susanna. The second, the Homu World Tour Championship, sees captains control chibi Valkyries to fight against one another to earn crystals, Valkyrie quicksand fragments, and previous outfits you may have missed. And finally, you can pick up new outfits for both the Hersher of Human Ego and the Hersher of Sentience. Download Honkai Impact 3rd now and use redeem code NEWCHAP to get 30 crystals, 2,888 asteroids, and one character trial card for free. Brand new players will have even more bonuses in-game to explore. Check the description and pinned comment to play now. And thank you Hoyoverse for sponsoring this video. For me, Fire Emblem Engage is in a bit of a weird place when it comes down to its writing. In my experience, I've seen plenty of people write off its entire cast because of its main story, and I can't really blame them. You can't expect people to continue investing their time in a game's characters and story if the first impression of them is not good. Were it not for writing about Fire Emblem being something I really, really like doing, the incredibly bland, safe, and corny tale that is Engage would have turned me off and who knows, maybe I would have dropped the game completely. And that would have been unfortunate, because then I would have missed out on the game's support conversations. When I finished reading all the supports, this was written before Engage's DLC came out by the way, and categorized them all into serious, funny, wholesome, and good, etc., the series veteran inside of me was drawn to Binding Blade. FE6 is an interesting comparison to make with Engage, because in some ways they're quite similar, and one of those similarities is the shortness of the support conversations relative to the series, as well as the conflicts that go on being easy to understand for all audience. I think for a game like this that was meant to appeal to a younger demographic, Having character conflicts be easier to resonate with is a sensible choice. Since, yeah, Engage isn't this dramatic war story with its characters all having tragic backgrounds because they were brought up in a corrupted political system. At the same time, Engage manages to provide depth, relatability, and staying power for its characters while keeping things relatively simple, which is something that the GBA games did, especially Binding Blade. Not to digress too far, but the thought reminds me of the following. Engage compared to Three Houses feels like comparing Binding Blade to Thracia 776 in a lot of ways, but that might be for another video. This video focuses on those more real moments in Engage, and my goal with this video is to showcase that this game, when its characters don't goof off, can actually have some grounded and serious interactions worth highlighting. So without further ado, let's get started. Saphir's Past Saphir is a knight of Brodia who, like her Brodian peers, has grown up through the war with Elusia. She is from a fishing village who suffered great loss at the hands of Elusia's counterattacks. Thirty years ago, in one of the raids, she witnessed the death of her parents and her best friend. Saphir is one of the few characters we play who has had to deal with the consequences of the war between Brodia and Elusia, innocent people whose lives are changed forever. Her support with Louis and Linden showcased the pain she continues to deal with even thirty years later. Louis and Saphir break the ice in their sea support, he offers her tea to help soothe her nerves as she was kept up all night by recurring bad dreams. In the B support, she's still dealing with the dream, and she explains that she relives the day her parents and best friend were killed in front of her. 
She goes on to explain how vivid the dream is, and that she had hoped it would fade away as she got older, but in spite of time passing and her station as a royal knight of Brodia, it's still just as traumatic as ever. With the damage already being done, Louis understands that he can't do anything to help her stop these nightmares, so instead he thought of the idea to brew her tea from home so it may stir up some positive memories, and Sophia hopes that remembering the moments with her loved ones will create happy dreams. You carry with you painful memories that never fade, though you dearly wish they would. I have seen you struggle with these memories time and time again. Now I cannot banish them for you. I haven't that sort of power. I suspect that no one does. But lately, I had a thought. Painful memories are not the only ones that can be tenacious. We are confronted with Saphir's childhood loss with Linden as well. Linden is a retired royal knight of Elusia, and participated in wars in the king's name. Putting two and two together, Saphir approaches Linden, but hesitates to ask her question. Okay. About 30 years ago, you'd already begun your career as a soldier of Elusia, right? Indeed I had. I joined as a royal soldier almost immediately upon graduating Elusia's National Academy. You must have taken part in campaigns against Brodia around that time then. Yes. Yes, I did. If I were to name a town or a village in Brodia, would you remember if... <sighs> no, this is inappropriate. I shouldn't be asking. Saphir, I... Uh... I'm sorry to bother you. I hope I didn't offend. In the B support, Linden does research into Saphir's past and realizes exactly what Saphir wanted to know, whether Linden participated in the attack that killed her parents and best friend. Linden offers an extreme solution should it mean Saphir could gain some way to ease her pain, for her to kill him. As if to say Linden is a personification of the Elusian army 30 years ago. I still shouldn't have asked. We're on the same side now. There's no need to dig this up. If you want to hate me, Saphir, you have the right. Even if you wanted me dead, I'd allow it, if it would ease your pain. What? Why would you say that? Because I mean it. I may not have done any harm to your parents personally, but I was a soldier in that war. I can easily see a world in which it was I who ended your parents' lives. I... I am a man long past his prime. I'd happily go to my end if it would bring you relief. And although words can change nothing now, I do apologize. I am truly, profoundly sorry. I can't do this. Excuse me. Finding it unreasonable, Saphir excuses herself from the conversation, upset. In the A support, Linden brings up the conversation again, thinking that Saphir, this whole time, held a grudge against him since he participated in the war. It's why he offered himself to her, but he's misunderstanding her. Someone else who misunderstands Saphir is Alir, who is worried that the ferocity behind Saphir's fighting style is motivated by something dark. In the B support, Saphir admits she fights so hard because she, in her own way, wants to live up to what her friend could have been, the strongest knight in Brodia. But Alir wonders if there's a desire for vengeance against Elusia too. She does admit that she still holds hatred for Elusia, but further states she pushes herself to honor her friend who was killed. The support ends with another concern from Alir. Fighting with a chip on her shoulder, with grief, may not be what her friend would have wanted for her, but instead, if they were her, they just want her to be happy. Time and time again, older characters often have something unique to offer in the support conversation department because they're more lived in than their younger allies. Saphir is an example of how the war has affected someone. Admittedly, a tragic backstory is nothing new to Fire Emblem but between Louis and Linden, it's handled tactfully. Louis knows a painful memory can't be fixed by something like T, and she will have to deal with this memory forever, and Linden apologizes for his leap in judgment about her feelings at the time, even if his heart was in the right place. I think Saphir's supports are a good start for this topic, as the next two subjects are measured and grounded in a similar way, but aren't overly dark or creepy, like, say, in previous videos where I highlighted creepy and dark moments. Alfred's Sickness Alfred, at first glance, is a kind of a weird combination of traits. He is a very skinny kid, but is constantly thinking and talking about training. He absolutely loves exercise and is always trying out some new workout routine. In fact, his support with Boucheron is all about him trying to figure out Boucheron's secret to his massive build. With Amber, he asks him if he's ever heard of a medicine that makes you ultra-muscular called Su-Protein. Basically, he's always aspiring to get huge. So it's weird that he's just this skinny kid, right? 
Alfred has actually been suffering from a severe illness since childhood, and he's found that fitness and keeping his vigor up was something that allowed him to continue his fight against it. It's kept secret from almost everyone except Celine and their mother, and in fact, the few instances where his illness is brought up in his support conversations are with his sister. In this support chain, Alfred is digging a hole in the ground because he heard the army was low on water and thought digging a well would be a good idea. Celine is chastising her brother because she's getting frustrated at Alfred's impulses to just turn everything into a workout, which makes the crown prince come off as barbaric. Alfred is a bit of an airhead who isn't thinking things through, but also doesn't really consider the consequences of his actions because his heart genuinely is in the right place and is taking the wrong things away from Celine's point. The A support begins with Celine walking in on Alfred digging another well because it's training but the tone is the opposite from before. Instead, Alfred is uncharacteristically wincing in pain, struggling to keep himself up. It puts a lot more into perspective of Alfred's personality. Alfred? Uh, What's wrong? Don't worry, Celine. It's, it's just an attack. It'll pass soon. Uh. An attack? Is it your old illness? Oh, I was doing so well. That part of my life was supposed to be long gone. Wait here! I'll fetch someone at once! No, stop! What? Why should I? I don't want anyone to see me like this. Not our allies, the emblems, or the divine dragon. I can't let them see this. A weak prince unfit to fight who could collapse any day? None of them would see you that way. They're far too gracious for that. But I would still know! And besides, I don't want them to worry about me. As far as they're concerned, I want to be the spirited prince who loves working out. Just let me rest for a while. I'll be fine. Please, Celine. Very well. But know that if your condition ever worsens, I will seek help. Thanks. It's true, he's a happy-go-lucky guy who has a naive streak, but people do look up to him as a bundle of energy and someone dedicated to self-improvement, and he doesn't want people to think he's the weak and sickly prince he used to be. He trains to continue to be who he really is. You know, that guy who his allies can depend on. This episode is the complete opposite of that. And it's really relatable too. It's like how he responds to Celine. Sure, his allies may look past this episode of weakness, but it's the fact that it happened. And when someone sees you like that, you can't take it back. I'm sure we all have vulnerable moments that despite our best efforts to fight them and hold them down, we'd still rather deal with it ourselves than feeling embarrassed that someone else saw us like that. I know that I've had plenty of those kinds of moments. When his attack settles down, the siblings speak of happiness after Alfred thanks her for being there for him. But it's now Celine who shows her own vulnerability, reflecting on how this war has affected her, the sadness she felt over being forced to leave the castle, and the dread of wondering what would happen if their mother, or Alfred, died in battle. And now, what would happen if his illness claimed his life? Shockingly, the last thing actually can happen. If he's not paired with Alir, he does die young. It's rare that Fire Emblem cuts its characters' lives short after the game. Lysithia's shortened lifespan, Canis dying in a snowstorm, and Clive being killed by pirates if Matilda died. Those come to mind. I know people really dislike when a character they are attached to dies even after they beat the game, but life for these characters is uncertain even after the last health bar on the final boss goes. Hortensia's Regret like I mentioned in my last video, Hortensia is one of those characters who I thought I would not like based off her design, which I still don't like, and her first impression upon fighting her, I found her… pretty cringe. But she does have a pretty decent little character arc going on in the main story having to do with accepting her father, the king's fate, and ultimately needing to fight him. Hortensia in her supports has several moments of important growth where we see her take things more seriously. She's young, immature, and has a tough time wading through her emotions, but is incredibly smart and talented and knows that Elusia will be depending on her. Two supports come to mind that show Hortensia having to navigate through situations that anyone would find difficult. First, her acceptance of Vale, the girl who, when she was mind-controlled, killed her dad. In the sea support, she completely denies any hope Vale has to talk about Hyacinth or what happened between the two of them. The memory of Vale laughing as her father was dying is burned into her mind. And for her, it doesn't matter whether or not she was controlled, it's that it happened, and she can't shake off that image. She has contempt for Vale and wants nothing to do with her, blaming her and the general worship of the fell dragon for her pain. When Vale tries to explain that being a fell dragon has given her nothing but hardship, she scoffs at the notion because she only views a fell dragon as a cruel yet powerful 
Thing, not who Vale is, a young girl being persecuted for something she can't control. Vale then tracks down Hortensia and tries to explain herself more, despite her continued dismissal. Vale tries to explain that her mother was just a regular dragon, but was herself persecuted by humans for being Sombron's partner, and when they saw that Vale didn't age, they targeted her too because they then knew that she was a dragon as well. Vale's story was meant to explain that being a fell dragon has been miserable and has given her entire life pain and loneliness, and it's hardly what Hortensia thinks it is. It's enough to move Hortensia to apologize for being cruel to her, and both girls essentially leave with a clearer understanding of one another, but letting bygones be bygones. But Hortensia's regret over dismissing Vale without even giving her a chance to explain herself catches up to her, and in the A support, she admits she was wrong and offers to try being friends, with no guarantees that she can ever truly forgive her. Although, when she realizes that both Vales were so different that even their taste in food was completely opposite, she becomes even more intrigued and excited at the prospect of mending the wound from their past. I can understand Hortensia's complete dismissal of Vale. An older, more mature person like Mavir or Vander is capable of separating her past actions with what she's doing to redeem herself, but Hortensia has the temperament of a kid because she's 14, and to me the support does a good job of letting her develop into a more forgiving character. When it comes to Linden, she's wrestling with another regret having to do with her father's death. Hortensia looks up to Linden and hopes that he can teach her about magic, but Linden turns down Hortensia's request because he simply doesn't have the energy left to return to tutoring on top of his other responsibilities like fighting in the army, but Hortensia doesn't quite understand it. Linden, can we talk? I was hoping you might reconsider giving me some lessons. As I said before, Princess Hortensia, I don't have the energy for teaching anymore. Besides, I've heard that you're already top of the class in the Illusion Academy, are you not? There's no reason to rush your education. Take the time to grow. <sighs> my father didn't live long enough to see me make it on my own. That's why I'm in a rush. I don't want any more regrets like that. Ah, uh, of course. I want my father to rest knowing I can take care of myself. Like your children do. You can help me with that, can't you? In the A support, she's seen talking to herself, worried about what she can do for Elusia, with Ivy slated to be queen, and folks like Linden, even in his advanced age, still contributing to Elusia's reconstruction. She wonders where she even fits in the whole thing, and pleads to her father for help. Linden swoops in and gives her some encouraging words, that she serves their kingdom well. At first, she doesn't believe him, and puts herself down comparing herself to Ivy. Linden then recounts a story where he, who was vouching for Hyacinth's older brother, her uncle, in a struggle for the throne. When her uncle eventually lost and fled the kingdom, Linden held resentment towards the now king. But the same feeling was not shared towards Linden himself. But one day, he uttered the same words to Linden as he told Hortensia. It's what makes him sure that he cared and valued Hortensia when he was alive, and it lifts Hortensia's spirits up. Hortensia is often shown as a brat who oozes overconfidence, but this support showcases that Hortensia does care about finding her lot in life. She shows nothing but respect towards Linden, and despite him refusing to teach her magic, she takes away an important lesson anyway, that things will be okay and she's on the right path. This is more of a wholesome end than a serious moment, but I figured I should end this brief character analysis on a positive note. I wrote this video before Engage's DLC characters were released, so I don't know what kind of value they provide for good characterization. But as it stands, the point of this video was to highlight moments where Engage's cast isn't fully embracing their silly tropes and colorful personalities. There's of course many more serious moments than just with these three, but these were some that I've been meaning to talk about for a while because they stuck out to me. Mavior, Yunaka, and even someone like Fogato have serious moments in their supports, so maybe I'll cover those in a separate video if you guys really want to see something like that. I hope that this video did give people a better impression of Engage's cast. I know it's really easy to fall into the trap of comparing Three Houses' cast with this one, since a lot of Fire Emblem fans are new these days and haven't played or watched support conversations from past games, but I'll be honest, there's really like no cast that really compares to the amount of trauma that those Fodlin kids went through. Give Engage's cast a shot like I did, and maybe you'll have a good time. I've opened up channel memberships. Before now, channel memberships were on the streaming channel and were personally a good way for me to experiment with streaming on YouTube, but I've decided to bring it to the main channel instead. Channel memberships currently give you the following perks. A member badge next to your name, custom emotes, members only status updates, behind the scenes videos, and exclusive Q&As. This is a great way to support my channel directly, and you can make use of these memberships today as I'll be streaming Fire Emblem Engage's Wave 4 DLC. Thanks for watching, deuces. Thank you.